morning. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. Maria's a little lighter today. She lost $1,250. <laughs> she is indeed. And, and I have to tell you, I did take a gasp when I saw all my car bills from my breakdown in oh, yeah. Cleveland. I was like, okay, we might have to dip into a... Another account here now, to make this Now, did you happen. ask Mike Kite to contribute the original 1000 for you? <laughs> he did bid the first 1000 Yeah, did. maybe I it, should. It, yeah. yeah. Are you on, Mike? Here's Are you your on? chance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm on. But I'm sad <laughs> and happy right now. <laughs> I hear you. I uh, hear you. It's all good. It's all good. It was good yeah. competition there for about 30 seconds, Mike. You were in, and then you were out. <laughs> you, you know, uh Prior, prior to the show, I Googled trying to find out as much information as I can about the, the guests coming on. I Googled the badger this morning. Yes. All I could find was something a little rodent with big teeth and a big tail. <laughs> <laughs> is that you, Mike? That is, that is absolutely me. <laughs> you know, Mike, uh, filling in the blanks, bid the first $1,000 of that uh, 1250 bid, which ultimately was won by Maria Lawrence in this for the West Virginia Penn State tickets with the proceeds we just uh, did earlier this morning donated to the backpack program. And Mike, I thought you would get all kind of love and glory in our comment section. Instead, you got scalded <laughs> for ridden so high right out of the box. <laughs> yeah, like like I took everybody else out. I'm like, come on. We, we said ahead of time what they, they were worth. I thought I was underbidden. Uh-huh. I, I believe you were, um, Mike, and so that's why I came in. But I don't know if you heard earlier, my concern was you were going to come in at like 9.59 and bid 12.51, and then I was going to be really mad at you. Yeah. But you didn't, so it's all good. But the, 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 the comical aspect of all this is Maria saying, I know how the game is played. Yeah. <laughs> she said back in, the game was not played by her rules. Well, and, you know, you could do... 1100 or 1010 mm -hmm. but come on I, again my rules are raise I, money I for the nonprofit, <laughs> yeah, and right. i win yeah. too yeah, that's right. right. um, the nonprofit won wins. that's exactly that's right, right. You, know, yeah. you know i had a similar thing happen i go out and i'll see the youth fair on auction night and i ah. go out and bid on the animals sometimes and um and I tried to do that at the auction, and, you know, every once in a while you have some of these animals and the, the bid prices aren't getting up there where they should be. So you try to help out like I was doing on the show. You, you throw a bid out there so you get it started, which is what I was trying to do. <laughs> but uh, at, the, at the youth fair, I got stuck with one, so I, I made sure that – that when Maria got in on this bid, I got out quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there there is an art to that because um, I've been to events, one in Morgantown not too terribly long ago, where there must have been, I don't know, 25, 30 um, silent auction items on a table, and this one particular person went through who was organizing and put the first bid on everything. Well, some of them didn't go past the first bid and mm -hmm. she got quite a few things that she wasn't expecting expecting to get. <laughs> and you yeah. always have to be ready you know yeah. so well, anyway and, and i shouldn't say i got stuck with something so you know these are all for a, a good cause so anytime um you you have the winning bid um you know it's all for a good cause so it's not like you're getting stuck a lot of these prizes are, are really good prizes the animals really get I'm going to eat these animals so I didn't get stuck with anything well and I'm always amused at um, I have a really good friend who um, is an auction connoisseur and she goes to a lot she bids a lot um, she's able to do that and she's always like look what I won and I'm kind of like well you did pay for it you know so <laughs> you know there's that oh. yeah Mike were you present at the detailed information given to the legislature by Jeremiah Samples regarding the state's drug use and abuse over the years? Uh, yes, I was. These numbers are absolutely staggering. An estimated 208,000 people in West Virginia used illicit drugs in the last month. Overall, the age-adjusted drug overdose death in the United States quadrupled but in West Virginia, the numbers are even more staggering. From 99 to 2022, West Virginia's overdose deaths increased 1,680%. The overdose rate in West Virginia, the death rate is 151% higher 
than the best state in the country, 36.4% higher than the worst state in the country besides West Virginia, and 85.6% higher than the national average. Uh, we've talked about this stat, which is uh, just heartbreaking. Of the 17,000 children born in West Virginia each year, 2,500 of those have already been exposed to drugs in the womb. What was your reaction as Mr. Samples was citing this information? You know, initially shock, and then at the same time, not surprised. You know, I, it, it's a travesty what's happened here in West Virginia, especially in the southern parts of West Virginia. And, and as I've said many times, you know, Mike Hornby and I had the opportunity to travel down south and, and see a lot of southern West Virginia this last session. And, and one of the things we, we came across down in Gilbert, which I believe is in Mingo County, um, uh, Delegate Mark Dean uh, was showing us around his town there. And one of the things he was telling us is he says there's, there's 500 people in the town of Gilbert, and there are five pharmacies. So you have to know that there's a problem here in West Virginia when you have five pharmacies for 500 people. It's just ridiculous what's going on. And, and you know, I don't know how you regulate it. Um, you know, I know DHHR is, is, is trying all kinds of different stuff to, to try to get this under control. Um, they're throwing a lot of money at the, uh, the SUD waiver and um, trying to find these, these individuals' help. Um, but you're right. The, those numbers were staggering. What was the conclusion at the end of the information that uh, was given, Mike, or what was the action piece that followed that presentation? Well, they, they've just hired uh, a new gentleman to, to oversee uh, um, the best practices in trying to, to correct this. Um, and, and he's a doctor. Um, he came in and, and he spoke uh, about some of the, the actions he wants to take. Um, and the interesting thing about him is he's, he's been in these programs. He's seen what works in other areas and what doesn't work. Um, he, he's been an addict himself. He knows, um, what it takes to get clean and sober and, uh, get back into society. So I'm hoping, um, that this individual is going to be able to take us to the next step, uh, in recovery in, in the state of West Virginia. So, I mean, that's my hope. Were you aware of the 2,500 children exposed to drugs in the womb stat before you heard it? No, no. And that was, I mean, that's devastating. What are the, what are the long-term effects of those individual kids? I mean, is it, is it things like ADHD? Is it, is it autism? Is, yeah, I don't know what those long-term effects are, but it's, it's going to be clear that West Virginia is going to be paying um, in the long term monetarily to, to help these kids in one way or another, um, probably throughout their life. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Mike. Uh, a couple of times this oh, morning, no. we've mentioned the, uh, the first foundation. Uh, what's the status of that? And that, that could be dollars yeah, that might address some of these problems. It's, um, they, they came in and they uh, did a presentation on that too. And they're, they're, still in the in the early stages of getting up and running and hiring the people that they need to hire and and um starting to uh to form the the grant process and and dis distribution of that money and um you know they have regional um regional directors uh you know matt harvey's one over in our area and and I think they're at a point now where you're going to start seeing some of that money dis distributed uh, to different places or, or across the state. That uh, It took a while for them to get up and formed, um, but it seems like they're in the right place now to, to start making a difference. To so, that... Uh, uh, ahead, to, so uh, it's taken a while, as we admit. Are you satisfied then with what you heard from their, their presentation the other day? I am because, you know, Here's the thing. I didn't want a foundation formed that just got, you know, haphazardly thrown together to start throwing out money um, without some some direction, you know, to, to know 
that you're spending the money wisely, that it's going to be used in areas that are effective, um, that are proven effective. So you don't want to just, you know, throw throw a group together. They're just going to throw some of that money out. It, it looks like they're uh, forming a strategic plan um, for distribution of this these funds uh, so that it can be lasting. So to that end, Mike, um, I was telling uh, Bill off the air, we had received a... Um, not a solicitation, but an invitation, if you will, from the Jefferson County administrator um, sent out to different groups, uh, an invitation to apply. And I want to say they have uh, 1.2 million that they're looking um, to, to give away. And she sent the, the parameters, which is 42 pages of you know, you have to go through and the application isn't 42 pages, but, you know, things that they would be interested in funding. So right. many of the, many of those programs are active treatment programs. Um, but I guess I wasn't aware that, that the counties, the cities, they were going to get the money and this was how it was going to be distributed. Is that, um, is that pretty well known then, Mike? Well, I think it is now. I mean, uh -huh. I don't know that anybody was sure how it was going to have play out to begin with. I think that's been uh, pretty well determined at this point. Okay. So um, I, I'm I'm glad there is a process. And, you know, like I said before, I just don't want this money thrown out. And then next thing you know, that you find out it's being misused. And, and that's not what we want to happen with this. So I'm glad they've taken some time and form this this organization in the right way on on toward that end uh mike uh does the legislators play any role at all of uh, providing a uh an oversight committee or oversight uh function to this i'm thinking about in the federal government the inspector general who is independent of the the agency looks and uh, if there is waste fraud and abuse they pick it up fairly early uh, Bill, not not really. Um, you know, we can we can request that the the directors come and report to Locker or the Health Committee, the Joint Health Committee, um, from time to time. But there's really no oversight um, from the legislature on this. This is this group was formed um, without legis. I mean, they didn't need legislative approval, so they were just formed. Um, through the settlement, and I believe, uh, you know, maybe Patrick Morsey had some say in, in all this. So uh, we'll hear from them um, from time to time, but um, no no real oversight. Yeah, and I, I can appreciate that, Mike, but also there's a lot of money here, and when there's a lot of money, a lot of folks involved, and there will, there will be an opportunity for uh, uh, some misuse of these dollars, and and well, there could be a hundred dollars used correctly, one dollar used incorrectly, and then it will taint and spoil the whole program. Well, Bill, you make you make a great point, but I would also like to point out that this isn't particularly state money. So Running. this isn't part of our revenue. This isn't part of our budget. So, you know, how much government oversight should there be of this? Um, you, I, I'm, a, I'm a limited government guy for the most part. So um, <clears throat> while I appreciate when they come and speak uh, publicly, um, to the legislature, I don't know how much uh, oversight the legislature should truly have if this doesn't fall within our revenue and our budget uh, process. Yeah, you're you're making an excellent point, Mike. Uh, but the point that I, I'm saying, I try, Bill. Yeah, yeah, and you do well, Badger. You do well. <laughs> Nicely <laughs> done. Nicely done. Uh, but. Uh, is there a sweet spot here that no one really has oversight responsibility? The state legislators don't have oversight responsibility. The federal government, I'm, I'm, I'm groping with. Uh, uh, is there someone looking at the the end product to ensure that the dollars are being spent correctly and wisely? Well, I'm wondering how much oversight maybe the Attorney General's office yeah, may okay, have yeah. of this group, and maybe they're sort of overseeing it, and uh, 
hearing reports back from them. So th- there may be some reporting there. And, and so far, they've been very transparent, which is exactly what you want to see. So I'm encouraged by the start of this um, and hope it continues to be just as transparent as it has been so far. So changing gears, Mike, um, what about 4% to 9% to that's going nowhere to that's going somewhere? Um, what's your take on that? Anything happening um, there? Well, they they haven't called a special session. So, okay. um, you know, I I expect that the uh, the triggers are going to trigger a 4%. Um, I'm, I'm not optimistic that we're going to have a special session at all um, coming up. So that would sort of make the, the 5% dead in the water. I, I don't see that happening at this point unless – some miracle happens down the road, and I, I don't see it. Um, well, you know, the, as, go as ahead. Republicans, we all want to see tax cuts, um, but we also want to see them in a responsible way. And, and um, you know, I don't want to see other areas in the state, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, falling by the wayside just so we can have a tax cut. We have to do this in a responsible way. I think that's why we did the triggers to begin with. And to push more um, than than what the triggers are doing, I, I don't know. There, there's still so many other places within the state that we need to shore up and need money. And and even though we have natural growth every year, I think rev, we're getting more and more revenue, even with the tax cuts. Um, we still have surpluses. So um, I, I think we need to shore up some of those other areas um, that need shoring up and just let the triggers do their work. Yeah. Uh, Mike, uh, Jason Hoffman was on earlier today, and he mentioned uh, with uh, with Marcy, who will probably be elected new governor, new legislators, they should take a hard look at our government, all aspects of the government, including ex- expending. Uh, is this an overly ambitious uh, uh, objective, and what is your position on what he's advocating? No, that this uh, I think I think every new administration does exactly this. They come in and they look at what they think is working from the the past administration and what needs to be tweaked and what just needs to be scrapped. Um, who's doing a good job, you know, as far as secretaries and 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 who's not doing, you know, what in in his opinion. Let's say it is Morsi, who in his opinion is not doing a good job and you know sort of take it from there so i i don't think this is overly ambitious this is what i would expect of a new administration um you know to, to try to make it their own so uh you know kudos to to patrick if 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 and when he is the new governor so i'm going to switch gears because we don't have very much more time mike um is the governor too distracted right now by all of the issues financially with the Greenbrier, with the non-payment of taxes, with all of his businesses? Um, is he less present um, uh, moving forward with some of these initiatives? Or um, what's your take on, on his um, uh, involvement right now with the, with the state? Um, no, I don't think he's he's any less distracted than he is any other. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, and, and I and I say that in a way that he has a team that sits in Charleston, and they they have the meetings, they deal with a lot of stuff, and then they report back to him what's going on. He he still directs what's going on. Um, I look at it no different than sort of me with my businesses i mean, i'm not i'm not at my businesses every day um i have good people that work for me uh, i communicate with them on a daily basis or regular basis and as long as things are all running smoothly then you know it, it's it's easy to to uh to manage but they if, if things do go awry if there is a fire here or there you know they call me and and i'm available to to try to put out that fire and I, i'm pretty 
pretty much think that the uh, the governor's position is the same way. If there's an issue, I'm sure his chief of staff is on the phone and telling him what the issue is, and, and he's giving advice, and this is what we need to do to fix it. Not not talking to the press very much about all of the, the financial issues. Lots of folks being shut out, well, Metro News and, and um, some of the other right, reporters. But I, you know, it, and I don't know enough about his finances to know how much he, he says a lot of this is political, you know, is it, you know, I've said before on this show that I, there's no such thing as a coincidence in politics. There just isn't. So, you know, the fact that all of these things start heaping up when he's right in the middle of his, his run for Senate, you know, are, are those coincidences? Ah, I don't think so. Are they legitimate? Yeah, maybe. Um, but the timing, you have Why to now? question the timing sometimes. Well, yeah. But, but so, and I'm okay if they're legitimate. Let's all right. Let's but let's but talk about them if they're legitimate. But who's driving the timing? It's the bankers and the foreclosures driving the timing more so. And than I the think press. Mike's point is it might be coincidentally politically aimed the timing. Well. Yeah, that's and that gets that's my rebuttal. If but, it was the press is generating, be one thing, but the press are responding uh, to the uh, foreclosure. Well, he's not the first governor to well, get mad at a reporter. Are Absolutely. So, uh, and that the, the two can be true. They don't have to be mutually ex- exclusive. You can indeed have violations, and it also can be timed politically because it may be motivated by someone trying right. to derail so the Senate. These have been ongoing issues for two, three, four years or whatever. If they've been ongoing issues, why now? Why Why at this point well, in his new campaign for Senate, why are they now coming? Why are they a big deal now and they weren't a year ago, two years ago? Well, but Because he, the loan was sold. The loan was sold to a, a new entity. Yeah, yeah, why? Why was it sold now, Bill? Well, I, I don't... I don't know that the, you know the timing we can fight about, but the fact of the matter is there are financial issues there, and they have well, been throughout throughout his tenure as governor. They have been there. These issues have been I there. Won't deny any of that. You're absolutely right, and and he he needs to answer for those. the The selling of the bank note, I think, is is very curious. Um, however, if if he hasn't paid for his employees insurance or health benefits or something like that sales tax or whatever you know that to me that's a bigger story than than whether or not you know some uh democratic operative like jamie diamond se- sells his banknote mm-hmm. um and, and they seem to work that that portion of it out the, the other is a bigger issue to me well and the point is that senator joe manchin is a democrat Jim Justice is a Republican. This is a Senate that could teeter 51-50, 50-50, uh, 49-51 the other way, and this, the control yep. of the Senate could be a huge issue. So everything is in play, and that's a fair point, Mike. Absolutely. It, it's it's Absolutely. a changing of parties at that Senate seat that Manchin sure was is. a lock for for a while. Uh, Mike, uh, six, is, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, 60 seconds left. Any final thoughts? They're yours if you want them. Uh, no, not really. I mean, we're, we're having uh, some good meetings down here in the interims. Um, next month, we're over in Parkersburg. We get to see the, the great town of Parkersburg and uh, see what's going on in that area of the state. I haven't been over there in quite a while, so I'm excited to see what's going on over there and uh, hear from uh, you know those particular legislators. So Very nice. Everything going good right now. Well, if Parkersburg's home, go see a Big Red's home game. They have one of the best home atmospheres, the whole build-up to kickoff and everything. And very the cool. North End Tavern, Mike. Put that on your that? bucket Ma- list. Maria's drinking. I'm going to go to sports. My, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Thank you, guys.